sustainable investing has come a long way. With rapidly growing interest from investors, it has become clear that there is a pressing need to better define this new investing paradigm. Dr. Ben Caldecott, founding director of the Oxford Sustainable Finance Program at the University of Oxford, Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment, will moderate the panel consisting of Jennifer Wu, Global Head of Sustainable Investing at J.P. Morgan, Elsa Palanza, Managing Director, Global Head of Sustainability and ESG at Barclays, and BNP Paribas Group's Head of Company Engagement, Antoine Sire. Now let's join Dr. Ben and the panel to discuss shaping the sustainable future of the world through finance. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, I'm here in London and very happy to be chairing this session at the Singapore FinTech Festival. And I'm joined, um, as the, uh, the uh, host said, uh, by three fantastic speakers from three global banks, JP Morgan, Barclays and BNP Paribas. We're going to hear from each of them briefly. Um, they're going to say a bit about what they're doing, their take on this very important, broad but important question. And then we're going to very quickly enter a, a discussion, a Q&A. I'm going to ask them some questions and we're going to keep it as interactive as possible over the 26 or so minutes remaining. So, Jennifer, you're going to go first. Um, over to you. All right, thank you, Ben. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Jennifer. Uh, my role at JP Morgan is to look after global sustainable investing at the asset management side. I joined the firm about 18 months ago. So why is this important to us? If you think about it, the growth of economy uh, in a nutshell is based on primarily two things, environment and human capital, right, labor. And the reality is that the growth that we're able to have today is because of the coexist coexistence of both of these things. But what we have seen, especially over the last you know, decade, is how uh, we have not really been uh, managing natural resources in such a way that you know, we are able to allow these two to coexist and such that we are able to generate the kind of growth in a sustainable way. So um, I think it's not a secret anymore that we are facing a uh, unprecedented crisis. Uh, it's something that I think most of us um, are, are, are really, really concerned about. So I think the question to ask uh, for us as individuals as well as practitioners in the financial industry is what's the role that we can play? Um, so from an investor standpoint, I think there are two key roles that we should play and are very focusing on uh, in our firm. One of which is how do we rethink the inputs and outputs of business operations in the context of making sure that there is a good balance between how natural capital or natural resources are being managed versus human capital management. And then the second thing is uh, really factor in all of the different transition um, considerations as we look at valuations of assets in the coming decades. And I think the last piece is really to focus on the externalities, right? The externalities of business operations, um, the impacts on the broader society. And I think the last point uh, that I want to make is that a lot of people say, well, this seems to be something new, right? Uh, it's not obvious that financial industry or asset management, investment management has been thinking about this for for a long time. Um, I would argue that that's not true. Uh, there's nothing new for the investment management industry to be thinking about non-traditional financial metrics. Um, this is something that the industry has been doing for a long time. What's changed is that, I think it echoes the, 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 the theme of this whole festival, which is around data and technology. We have more data than ever before and much better technologies, be it um, algorithm, AI, or even uh, looking at renewable energies and all of these new technologies that can help us to transition to a more sustainable economy. So I think for us, the focus really should be around how do you then take the innovation that we have and translate that into something that can really put companies and uh, you know uh, business practices at the forefront of pushing for this transition to happen in a quicker and more effective way. And thinking about data, you know, just the, the, the amount of data that we're able to leverage as investors to help the dialogue that we have with companies is more than ever. Think about how we can use satellite images to really look at whether a company is doing a good job on the environmental side. That's something very powerful, not something that we, we had access to, but it's possible now. So I think from an investment standpoint, there's really no excuse as an investor to look at these new data sets and, and figure out how we actually use them to, to, to fight against um, the crisis that we have. Back to you, Ben. 
Great, thanks, Jennifer. Um, great opening remarks. Um, Elsa, over to you. And for, for the audience, Elsa was just on a David Attenborough documentary recently. So look, <laughs> check out Too Big to Fail and you'll see Elsa again. But you've got her now. Over to you, Elsa. Thanks, Ben. I feel like I need to hire you as my PR. Um, lovely to, to be with all of you. Good morning from London. Um, thanks for, for this opportunity to be with you all. I think building off of Jennifer's really um, excellent opening remarks, there's a few things that I'm thinking about. Um, first of all, in my role, I lead our the full ESG integration across the firm and also think about our own policy development and positioning, um, thinking about the types of, of um, engagement we will have in the real economy, whether or not we need to set up certain policy positions around things like sensitive energy sectors, um, and also thinking about how to incentivize and support the growth of green finance and sustainable finance inside the, the firm. Uh, I think a couple of sort of broader comments I'd add to what Jennifer said is that fundamentally what we're going to require here is a whole of economy transition, uh, that this is not something that we can pick apart. Each of us have a role to play, um, but it would be easy to sit here and just focus on our own little niche. And and as Je Ben mentioned at the start, there's we have little time to cover what is a very, very broad topic. But fundamentally, we have to think about how the, the public sector and social sector um, and real economy, including the financial institutions playing within that, can, can actually advance um, together in a way that, that unites the, the entire economy and moves it all forward. From the Barclays perspective, we're really thinking about how we can play a role in affecting that transition We've uh, set up a, an ambition to be net zero by 2050, um, and that uh, is all well and good to have a long-term goal in place, but the real question is how you start to affect uh, the movement and strategic direction of the bank to actually um, move in that direction. Um, fundamentally, we're seeing uh, the need to um, put much more effort into the, the advancement of our own green finance. We've set a goal to um, meet 100 billion of green financing by 2030, and also to to um, really think about our own equity investing, a small but important um, goal of 175 million of equity investment in nascent uh, um, innovation in green finance. Um, again, those numbers are all well and good, but I think the fundamental idea here is how do you actually change the nature of the bank um, to be moving in the right direction. And um, fundamentally, there's this, this need for interplay between investors um, and banks and our clients and that hopefully virtuous cycle that we start seeing where we can lean into our clients to make the transition necessary, give them the support they need through, uh, through green and sustainable financing, and indeed get the right kind of support from the investors on the other side to help affect that change. Uh, I'll stop there for now, but we can leave some time to get into questions. Thanks. Great. Yeah, lots to unpack there. Thank you, Elsa. Antoine, over to you. Thank you. So, uh, hello from uh, Paris. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, our motivations uh, are not very far from the ones of uh, Jennifer and uh, and Elsa. So, I, I will not repeat uh, what they say. At, at uh, BNP Paribas, uh, I'm head of company engagement, uh, which means that I sit at the executive committee of the bank uh, to... Uh, uh, introduce a positive impact uh, for uh, society and uh, and climate uh, in uh, everything uh, we do uh, through uh, our uh, uh, business and uh, investments, but uh, also through our uh, uh, HR or procurement policy. We try to uh, to, to consider as a whole uh, uh, how we are uh, dealing uh, with the changes of society. It's absolutely true as Jennifer uh, rightly said, uh, that it is not new uh, that we have to take into account uh, externality. Uh, nevertheless, the worries uh, for climate, biodiversity, inequalities, uh, and uh, probably territorial imbalances uh, are probably higher uh, than they were uh, in, the, in the previous period. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, the, the data and the technology uh, allow us to take uh, into account uh, things uh, that were never taken into account systematically uh, with uh, uh, accountancy-like uh, process uh, by uh, uh, banks uh, and, uh, and investors. So uh, uh, we try to, do, to, to conduct this approach uh, through uh, a deep transformation of the company, a transformation of our processes, a transformation uh, of our skills. Uh, and uh, if we go uh, 
uh, to, uh, to what we do uh, uh, in business. Uh, we clearly uh, do it threefold. threefold. Uh, first, uh, uh, is we do it through our balance sheet. With, uh, with sell sector policies, uh, with uh, position papers uh, uh, on biodiversity, on ocean, and also with methodology to, uh, for example, uh, to uh, make a portfolio uh, alignment uh, on the Paris uh, Agreement. Uh, we are one of the, the banks that uh, initiated uh, application of the PACTA methodology uh, to banks. You know that this uh, methodology uh, will help us uh, to uh, align uh, really our portfolio uh, with the Paris Agreement. Uh, we take it sector by sector. Uh, we are already uh, more than aligned uh, uh, on the coal uh, uh, sector. Uh, we still have uh, a lot of work to do on, uh, on other sectors, but clearly uh, we are uh, uh, trying to introduce ways uh, to uh, pilot our banking portfolio that were never uh, in our criteria uh, of, uh, of uh, piloting portfolios uh, uh, before. And this is really uh, new. Second, of course, we are working a lot uh, to uh, incentivize uh, uh, nature or climate positive actions and transition uh, through clients. Uh, we, we develop as uh, our, our, uh, uh, certain of our competitors, uh, uh, both sustainability linked loans, uh, um, uh, ETF or other funds linked to circular economy, blue economy. Uh, we are active in blended finance solutions, uh, investing in startups uh, uh, with impact, with dedicated envelope. So it's a, it's a real effort which is doing uh, at all stages in the company. You know that we are both a retail bank and an invest bank, in investment bank. So we, we, we do this uh, uh, from both sides. And, and finally, uh, uh, we, we work uh, a lot in coalitions. We have coalition with the Monetary uh, Authority of Singapore, a coalition, international coalition that are emerging like TNFD. Uh, uh, I am pleased to, to, to co-chair the international working group for biodiversity. Uh, we are working with uh, a lot of our fellows, including Barclays and JP Morgan uh, in, uh, in task force uh, uh, all, all over the world. So it's a, it's a real transformation. And uh, it's, a, it's very interesting because it connects us uh, to, our, to the, the roots of the banking system, which is uh, helping the society to solve its problem. But uh, the way uh, we are trying to do it, I believe, is really new. Great. Um, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank uh, you. No, there are lots of themes there I want to pick up on. Um, so one one theme you all touched on um, is working with clients and how you work with clients. Um, you know, you want to uh, get the balance right. You want to be providing solutions. You also want to be providing some challenge. Um, how are you? Uh, yeah, how are you trying to get the balance right? And I'll maybe start with with Jennifer and then Elsa, and then we'll get out. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. I think. Um, uh, it's been a journey, um, and partly because a lot of the issues that we're dealing with um, hadn't been as obvious as what we can see today. Uh, so take climate transition as an example. Having conversation with clients three, four years ago, um, I think the picture was very different from the kind of conversation that we're having today, whereby today you know, the policy directions are much clearer and commitment from global or globally, like governments, policymakers, as well as uh, corporations, are, are just much more prevalent than I would say three, four years ago. So I think the financial implications, and which is what our clients care a lot about, be it short term or long term, is just much more obvious. So um, I say it's been a journey because I think we spend a lot of time trying to explain to our clients by by way of just showing them that. If you hadn't considered these type of new phenomenon and issues that's not traditional, what could be the return trade-off versus if you had taken this into consideration, what would that potentially look like? Um, it's not to say that we have a crystal ball into exactly how the world will pan out or how policy will play out, but I think it's really important as part of this journey that we're all on to really give our clients as much clarity as possible. And when I say clients, most of our clients are institutions, right? So pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, uh, insurance companies, banks, et cetera, uh, just to allow them to see 
how this would play out in their own investment portfolios and and um, give them the option, right? And what I've found is that, especially this year with COVID, uh, one thing became very clear is this, there's just much greater appreciation for how important it is that we need to be ready for something that's so systemic, that is so big and and and, and could disrupt everything. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to to be able to have a, a lot more, in my mind, constructive conversation with clients. And I think similarly, not so much clients for asset management, but broadly for, for the bank, really with corporations. Uh, so, you know, through my work, engaging with companies as a shareholder or a bondholder, as well as JP Morgan as a whole, dealing with its customers on financing. I think we're seeing, seeing similar trends whereby companies are actually uh, becoming more and more proactive in wanting to change, and they're seeking advice from either their financiers, banks, uh, shareholders to, to understand how can we work together to actually transform. And I think that's a big, big change, which I hadn't seen um, you know, two, three years ago. So and in, in a way, I'm pretty optimistic about where we're going, but it's been a, re it's been a journey and it's not, we still have quite a long way to go, I have to say. The, the good news is that there's much clarity on transition risks and opportunities. Um, and, and that's something that I think it's recognized by not just investors, but also companies. So you know, going back to what I said, like there's no excuse for us to ignore that and then really think about how you can align business operations to what a good pathway should look like to, to get us to Paris. Um, and then I think on the other hand, probably more work needs to be done on the physical risks and opportunity side. Um, but I like to say, like I said, we have more technology than ever, right? Uh, it's just something that we need to be, to take a more, using Antoine's word, to do it more systematic, systematically across all portfolios, as opposed to standalone single in, uh, investment vehicles or products. Yeah, that is a, a very big challenge. But just just quickly, I mean, what what happens if a client just doesn't get it? So fast forward, you've been engaging with a client, a corporate client, say, and they just aren't listening to the advice. They don't, you know, they're like, we're well, fine, whatever. We're going to just keep doing what we're doing. What we're doing is completely incompatible with Paris. What does J.P. Morgan do about it, and when? Yeah, so I think um, the way of showing them the financial trade-off uh, has proven to be really quite powerful um, because at the, at the end of the day, you have to make it relevant to them. And if the client's sole objective is to generate better financial return over the long run or even short run, uh, I think this is the most powerful thing that you can show them. And I find I found very few examples whereby if you're able to show them that uh, trajectory, they 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 would still say no. This is not something I care about. You will still get challenged by clients on the assumptions that you build into the models and the different options. Um, but I I think you know we're at a point whereby technologies for renewables are just a lot cheaper. Policies have real in, uh, economic cost implications on all sectors around the world. So I think the debate is not so much okay. I don't. I just don't care. The debate is more around. Okay, you know, based on what you are showing to me, you know, are the assumptions right? And am I really looking at a potential loss in value in my portfolios or in my businesses uh, over the next five years, or is it more like three years or even ten years? So, so your, clients, on the, your clients are rational, <laughs> and they're listening to you. <laughs> it sounds like that's that's. Good. I think we've been we are very lucky to have good clients. Let me put it this way. <laughs> good, good. Um, Elsa. Yeah, so I think again, building off of um, some really excellent points from Jennifer, I, um, I, I'd say that I would probably divide this up depending on who we're talking about in our in our client portfolio. Um, we're seeing a huge amount of movement in our corporate bank um, when we're thinking about small and medium sized enterprises and and just how much movement there is there. I'd say the majority of our portfolio, not to overgeneralize, is is in the UK and the EU, and considering the the broader. Um, environmental factors there just in terms of the general support for green and sustainable enterprise. I think that's moving very, very quickly. And so if anything, I think we're getting a lot of incoming requests from our corporate entities asking for more support, and there's a huge amount of movement there. When we think about our investment bank, which again, not to overgeneralize, but is largely headquartered in the United States, um, it's been a bit slower, although these are largely multinational enterprises who I think, to Jennifer's point, are really seeing the writing on the wall when it comes to the financial implications of not taking seriously um, the issues of, of climate change and, and sustainability broadly. We're seeing that that's, that's a fundamental driver. If you're looking at your own portfolio as a, as a corporation and thinking, 
for example, if you are an energy company and uh, there's a very real chance for stranded assets to be to be you know facing you in the near term, you have to make some strategic choices, and that's helping to move the the nature of those businesses along. Um, I do think that. Uh, the policy environment matters a lot here, and uh, I, you know, a lot of people are very excited about what's happening in the U.S. and whether or not there will be a dramatic policy shift there. I think we can probably reasonably expect there to be um, some change, but we also can't lean into that wholly as the sole driver for for real adjustment in the in the sort of multinational or or U.S. based space. Um, when we're thinking about the alignment of our own portfolio, as I mentioned, we're, we've committed to align the entirety of our portfolio to Paris. We've started with energy and power, um, which frankly are most material for Barclays and are, are most challenging in many ways um, because of the sheer nature of, of those portfolios. I think the power sector, again, is moving very quickly in its own transition. Uh, the energy sector is a little bit tougher. Um, and so we're finding we need to kind of lean in um, with different incentives and different conversations, depending on who those clients are. Um, lastly, I think that that Jennifer's point about COVID is a really important one, that fundamentally we've all been faced with this idea of sort of existential threat and, and the need. We've seen a lot of consolidation in the market uh, just because of the financial threat posed by, by COVID and the economic loss. Um, and that's made people, companies rethink uh, how they're engaging. I think to the extent that banks can be stewards of um, that green transition that so many governments are talking about and actually really help to affect that, that's, that's a question. I think we're all keen to do it. It's just a matter of how we set up the right incentives and the right frameworks to help make that happen. Thanks, Elsa. Antoine. So, uh, yes, it's, uh, it's very important to say that all starts uh, from the clients, but uh, the situation is really uh, changing very fast uh, uh, with the clients. Uh, you know, we started uh, uh, 10 years ago to have uh, coal policies, uh, uh, then uh, we put out of uh, shale oil, uh, and uh, we, we started to uh, discuss a lot with, uh, with our clients. And when we started to discuss uh, sustainability issues and to explain them that they would have uh, an importance in our uh, choices as a bank, uh, 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 a few years ago, uh, uh, a lot of them uh, were uh, quite uh, astonished. Uh, it was uh, really surprising for them. Uh, now, it's sometimes a bit the contrary. Uh, we can discover that some of our clients uh, have scorecards uh, that they assess uh, our own uh, sustainability policy uh, and sometimes uh, start uh, to ask questions uh, and to tell us, hey, uh, we want uh, to have uh, very sustainable banks. Uh, and uh, what, you, what did you do this year? What, you, what did you do this uh, there? So the, the very situation currently is that there is a, a huge uh, uh, span uh, uh, between the, 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 the less mature uh, clients and the, and the most mature clients. And, and this, this is uh, uh, at the same time a bit uh, of a headache uh, and uh, at the same time very, very interesting and, and opens uh, a lot of, uh, of possibilities because at the same time, some clients are still very reluctant to listen to our argument and sometimes force us to, to be a quite, uh, um, to, to, to put quite pressures and sometimes to, to pull out. At the same time, other of our clients uh, are uh, creating uh, tools uh, that meet um, climate objectives with financial objectives. They are really uh, uh, very advanced, and uh, we have more or, uh, and more uh, to learn from them. So it's uh, it's a, it's a, it's a very complicated situation because it's uh, the, the the level of, uh, of the, the the clients uh, is is very uh, is very diverse, and the, to a certain extent, uh, it uh, it makes us necessary to reconnect uh, much more uh, with our clients. Because sometimes 
uh, when you go to senior bankers in the bank, they know, uh, they say, I know my client, I know what is important, and it's true that they know well the last results that were posted by the client. But uh, did, they re did they really try to understand how the client has been recently uh, reinterpreted? Re uh, reinterpreting uh, uh, its challenges, its culture, what is really changing. And the sustainability change is an important change at the client. So if you, if you know well your clients, you understand it well, and to a certain extent, it's a, it's a very good uh, uh, exercise uh, to, of uh, listening to the clients. Yeah, that, absolutely. So uh, a question that I'm going to open up, so uh, feel free to pounce on it. Um, obviously, this is the Singapore FinTech Festival. So I'm interested in uh, examples of FinTech um, that you have been using to support your clients and enabling transactions and so on. Have you got have you got good examples you want to share briefly? I'm happy to start. So for us, I think um, FinTech, big data, uh, AI, machine learning has really transformed, uh, in my mind, investment management over the course of the last uh, two, three years in the sense that we're able to basically process and access a lot of unstructured data in such a way that we can explore if we're able to create a forward-looking signal that tells us a bit more about the true, what I call ESG performance of companies. So things like, um, you know, for instance, tapping into NGO data. Um, as you probably know, right, if we wait until a violation, uh, environmental violation gets picked up by mainstream media or uh, it's already being reported by companies themselves, it's probably too late purely from an investment standpoint. It's probably already priced in. So what are some of the data sets that we can look into to effectively help us get a better understanding of what's actually going on? So one way that we are exploring is to tap into NGO data. And, and there is, they're all mostly unstructured. It could be reports posted on their website or some other forms. And the way to use that is and process that data is to leverage uh, natural language processing. Uh, to, that to, to really scrape through all the data that, and help us to identify and classify um, you know, information in such a way that we know, okay, this is related to pollution, for example, uh, in the textile industry. Um, and the potential financial implication of that can then be built into the valuation models that our equity analyst or credit rating model that our fixed income analyst runs, right? And that helps us to make investment decisions and also helps us to articulate to client why consideration of these sustainability factors using fintech uh, is so important and what is it that we're able to do that you can't really do in a traditional financial investment research way i.e looking at financial statements figuring out what the right valuation is etc so th that's one example yeah. that we use but across the board we're using i think we're definitely relying on um, machine learning and fintech a lot more but at the end of the day you still need human behind it to ask the right questions and then to be able to understand whether this information is just noise or actually useful signal. Yeah, no, thanks, Jennifer. And also very interesting to see that uh, an NLP specialist, True Value Labs, was acquired by FactSet the other the other week. Um, okay, we're being timed out, so we've got about a minute left. Uh, what are your priorities for 2021? Give me your, your top priority in 20 seconds, Elsa, and then Antoine, and then Jennifer. Top priority is to lean into the transition and think about how we actually make this greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, fundamentally, thinking about how we can play a role in moving the whole economy, not just by big targets or, or sort of headlines, but actually get into the nitty gritty of adjusting our own strategy and the strategic direction of our clients. Great, thanks Elsa. Antoine, 20 seconds. Uh, priority is certainly being able uh, to uh, uh, tag, assess uh, uh, systematically uh, our portfolio on uh, uh, ESG criteria on the, the largest uh, part of our portfolio uh, uh, possible, to have the largest part of our portfolio, uh, which will be integrated in the systematic uh, uh, approach. Uh, it's uh, to be a bit uh, early to make public targets, but, uh, but clearly it's the, it's the move. That needs to be a priority for the next five years, not just the next year, but absolutely. Um, Jennifer, last word to you. All right, very quickly. I think to be climate risk, tr climate transition risk aware across all investment portfolios and financing activities really has to start today. I mean, better yet, yesterday. Yeah, 
couldn't agree more. Um, well, thank you so much for joining this panel. Really interesting conversation. We could have covered many more things. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, but thanks to the panel and back to the FinTech Festival. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. And thanks very much for that. That was uh, Dr. Ben Caldecott. Um, uh, doing a quick wrap-up of his last panel session. Now, uh, so far today, we've been talking about uh, sustainability and climate change. We've been talking about how fintech can actually fit into the entire ecosystem to um, keep on track uh, towards the Paris Agreement. Now, technology is, of course, we know that it's reshaping the financial services industry and it's uh, powering a more sustainable world. In the pandemic economy, more and more people are uh, turning to digital payment and e-commerce uh, platforms, and this shift has reduced carbon emissions, as we've heard with some of the speakers, and has op opened up new opportunities for fintech disruptors to expand across, uh, expand access to capital. Uh, but prior to COVID-19, uh, the barrier holding us back from realizing the sustainable, uh, sustainability development goals was really not scarcity of funding, as some would say. Uh, the United Nations has noted before that there is actually more than enough finan available financing for reaching the goals, uh, given that the uh, gross world product uh, and the global gross financial assets are over 80 a trillion US dollars as well as 200 trillion US dollars respectively. So the real barrier to uh, achieving sustainability goals is actually in the distribution of these funds to emerging markets and uh, to the communities that most need it. And the United Nations uh, estimates that uh, approximately two and a half trillion US dollars a year is needed to meet these sustainability development goals in emerging countries. And uh, the use of fintech can actually bridge this gap. So digital technologies are supporting the transition to a more inclusive, a more sustainable planet by channeling public and private resources to fund uh, the sustainability development goal technologies. Now, for those who are fresh and new to the Singapore FinTech Festival, uh, we are on day three covering the Impact Summit of the uh, FinTech Festival 2020. It is uh, with the backdrop of the global pandemic uh, crisis that the FinTech Festival is bringing an international community together. We've got 600 speakers from over 50 countries sharing their insights and providing views on uh, what we can expect in 2021, that's next year. Now this year, the, the SFF has added uh, four new experiential sessions and activities. We've had live sessions with climate scientists from research locations in polar caps, Amazon forests, solar energy farms, and the Himalayas. Uh, earlier today, we uh, heard from scientists from the Antarctica. Uh, we also went to the Hindu Kush uh, Himalayas as well. So uh, there were some really good insights into those areas, the challenges they're facing, uh, the urgency of this climate change problem as well. Uh, we also cover skills upgrading through live masterclasses brought to you by leading industry experts on APIs, platforms, cloud, uh, AI, and cybersecurity. We've also got an immersive online city experience to interact with hundreds of exhibitors and sponsors showcasing their innovations globally and also finally the behind the scenes sessions that we've had today uh, for an insight look into how global private equity and venture capital firms operate. And throughout uh, Singapore FinTech Festival, do look out for uh, these events, Deal Fridays, where investors and corporates get to meet over 20 curated fintech startups, uh, meetups, we've got meetups as well. These are private sessions with thought leaders where they deep dive into key uh, discussions around some of the current topics of today. Uh, we've got Ask Me Anything sessions, the AMA sessions, uh, for any questions that you may have for all the movers and shakers of the fintech industry. Now, the Singapore FinTech Festival, it provides a very rich and immersive experience combining physical and online access. You can explore the online city uh, throughout the event to network with other participants and exhibitors. We've had many sessions over the last three days. Uh, if you've missed any of them, please feel free to uh, uh, to enter the website, the event website for uh, demand download as well. 
We've got digital premium passes available to provide access to workshops, uh, demos, networking zones, uh, private mentorship sessions, Deal Fridays, uh, which is a special event for fintech startups and investors. Now, if you're physically in one of the fintech hubs, you may join one of the many curated offline events subject to respective safe distancing measures. Meanwhile, our global content includes aggregated uh, curated sessions from Global Satellite Event Partners, or GSEP. You may ch also check out the Startup Program, which includes the FinTech Awards and the Global FinTech Hackcelerator. Now, throughout the Singapore FinTech Festival, you'll also be able to enjoy global lab crawls. We've got Accenture hosting a one that's 24 hours long. This will bring you to Accenture Innovation Centers, studios and labs across the world from Sydney to Singapore, uh, from Dublin to San Francisco. MasterCard, uh, MasterCard also has a series of 10 lab crawls running live across the week. Attendees can deep dive into everything from how MasterCard harnesses big data to reimagining city designs to how they elevate the consumer experience to the next level of personalization. So to join, visit Online City, navigate to Networking Area, and then Lab Crawls. Now, from our last session, we're going to keep with the theme of investing for the future. So our next panel will discuss policies and technologies to overcome the challenges of private investment into renewable energy infrastructure. This session will be moderated by Malavika Jane Bambawali, Managing Director and Head of APEC for Sustainability Solutions at NG Impact. Now, her panel will consist of Boon Chin Hao, Managing Director, Head of Asia and Emerging Markets Infrastructure at GIC, Maja Zanbergen Albers, Head of Sustainability Integration at Robaco, Sumitomo Mitsui Banking Corporation's Executive Officer and Head of Investment Banking Department Asia, Rajiv Kanand, and Maria Stark, Managing Director of Funding Port. Let's now go to Malavika to find out more about shaping the future of long-term investing in renewable energy infrastructure. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Malavika, and I work with NG 